Um, I want to say something first. Um, we saw Thursday night uh, the film on Willie Velasquez, and uh, some of you did. Um, the Southwest Voter Registration Education Project founder back in 1974, when it started that work officially, he, he died 30 years ago uh, at the age of 44 of cancer. And he uh, invited me. I went to work for Southwest Voter after teaching about a dozen years at university. One of them here at Our Lady of the Lake. Um, and he asked me if I wouldn't help start a research endeavor. It was, became the Southwest Voter Research Institute. So I was working since 1982 with him. And in 1988, the Institute, about the time of the Contra War, uh, sponsored a trip down to Managua, Nicaragua, of Latino leaders from the United States. Um, it was headed, uh, actually, our, the head of the dele our delegation was Tony Anaya, the governor of New Mexico. And there was a dozen uh, Latino leaders that went to, it was a fact-finding mission down there. And Antonio was the one that designed and planned that, that mission, that visit. And he was a history graduate student and a, a history student who had graduated with very much an interest in Latin America. So Antonio Gonzalez, who was not only uh, one of our uh, staff members <coughs> working on, those, on a number of voter registration drives, but a hell of an organizer, <laughs> later took over and became president of Southwest Voter Registration Education Project. And it was a deja vu, a terrible deja vu experience this week when I heard that, that um, Anto <clears throat> Antonio had died of cancer just like Willie had died of cancer 30 years earlier. He was only 62 years old. And I think what it does is it sort of brings to us the reality of the fact that we're not going to be here forever. We're not going to be uh, leading this effort going forward. And we've got to be attentive to how we transfer that knowledge, that energy, that verve that he had on to others to carry it forward to the younger generation. So I think what we're doing this conference is really preparing the next leaders uh, to take up the mantle that Willie Velasquez had passed on to us. And some of those who testified in 1968 were with us at this conference and they were able to share some of what they have learned over these 50 years. A Joe Bernal, for example, our state senator back then. Um, Father Ralph Ruiz, who testified also. Um, and and there, I'm sure there, there there were others that are still around that testified, but it was those people that left that impression and should indeed uh, be an impression on the new generation to take this forward. So I think it's very important that we keep that in mind. And at this place in the conference, we're doing some critical thinking. I'm going to tell you, um, Richard came to me a couple of years ago, I guess, and we, he said, I, we, we really need to 
think of a way of, of documenting um, what went on in those 50 years. And so we put together a committee and get, got some ideas of, of who might come together and, and help us out on that. And we contacted a number of, of people. I would, I would call them experts in their own fields uh, with an idea that when we look at those 50 years, we can find out exactly where we're going to go and evaluate it. We can look and see where we're going to go from here. Uh, so what we want to do, I think, with our decision <clears throat> uh, makers of today is at all levels of government and from both, both parties is to try to, to make policies that are based on facts and based on data that drives their decisions, not on prejudices, not on ideologies. And so that's the reason, that's the way we went to go seek for these, these, these excerpts. To, and, and then they came forward too. We didn't have any money. Um, so we didn't have a grant. Um, but Richard uh, came up with the idea of, of doing this, and I think it was a great idea. And this conference obviously must have caught <laughs> on because look at the participation that we got. The people, it must be a vital time with some very important issues. So our idea was to, with this group that we of experts to get to review the changes that have taken place over the past 50 years in a particular area to try to look at the trends and the data that it was available, uh, examine the progress that had been made, identifying what works, and, and identifying what inequalities and, and inequities still exist among racial and ethnic minor groups in Texas. So we asked them to look at that history to come up with finally some recommendations. And they came up with some. And I want you to know that um, these are available to everybody. <laughs> They're online now on, on the website, 50yearslater.org, and you can download them. Uh, from that website, uh, and I, I will say we have some printed copies for the executive committee and the authors. If you haven't picked yours up, please, please do. But what they did was these experts reviewed the 1,200 plus pages from the commission uh, hearing in 1968, the five and a half days of testimony, and they they did some rather extensive evaluation of in those hearings of education, the topics of employment, administration of justice, um, economic issues, even a lot of time spent on the Valley Farm Workers, which was a very important uh, issue. At the time a strike had just gone out in 1966 in the Valley. Um, and to those, we added a couple of issues that we think have become important since then that were not discussed extensively in the hearings. Immigration is one of them, as you know, probably a top issue today, uh, a great concern. We added housing. Uh, we added voting rights. Um, and so, and voting rights, of course, became very important after 1975 when Texas was included in the Voting Rights Act. Uh, as it, it, uh, <clears throat> coverage under Section 5, so that it was very important that these be covered extensively, and we got some good people, I think, to cover them. Let me, get, so my job today is to just introduce you to them, um, some of these experts. They, not all of them may be here, but I'm, I'm going to mention them so that afterwards, you can sit down with them uh, in the students and they can engage with, with the young people and not just students, everyone, in the uh, various breakout groups and discuss those 
those topics. On uh, Latino population, we, we got probably the best demographer, I think, that, uh, that San Antonio has, um, uh, and, and, and he's nationally known. <laughs> Rogelio Sainz is a, a dean of policy studies at UTSA, and he, he's, he just, in his work, what he did was he took the census data, Starting in 1960, samples of the census data, they're called micro uh, data files. And <clears throat> for each decade since 1960, seven different periods, he, he got the data on those and plotted it out on, on trends. And it's very interesting to look at those lines, those charts that he produced there in his report here, to see what types of changes have taken place and what types of inequalities exist because he compared groups, ethnic groups. And I think it's, it's uh, magnificent uh, to be able to just look at, and that's why if, if, you, if you notice that the, you'll see this one chart over and over, the population uh, growing among Latinos and, 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 and approaching the population of, of uh, the Anglo population. And it, 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 is, it is amazing that um, some of the projections that he make um, uh, are, are, are in there that will, will really be de determining what in the future, uh, I think, what type of a state we have. We decided to focus on Texas. And I think uh, that was important because we wanted to give a local focus. And so this, this may apply to others. I want to also introduce the others. Um, Henry Flores um, uh, worked on immigration, on um, um, political scientist Henry, Henry Flores from St. Mary's University, uh, now uh, Professor Emeritus. Uh, worked on uh, the history of discrimination, um, and uh, Henry is here, so he goes to the We also have um, two attorneys, one of them, uh, Roberto Juarez, from the Dean of the School of Law in Denver, uh, University of Denver, he's here, and his co-author is Ernest Herrera, and Ernest uh, is, is a MALDEF attorney, um, and they did a, a review of over 300 cases that were brought in Texas on voting rights. It's the most thorough review that has been done, I'm sure, on Texas voting rights law and it, it's I think it's very very magnificent you'll see the list partial list of the cases in the back of his paper in an appendix and in in educate in the field of education we have uh, the intercultural development research association I Jose Cardenas was one of those who testified back in 1968 he was an educator back then who, uh, at the university, uh, he, he was, <clears throat> and right after he testified, soon after the next year, he became superintendent of Edgewood. And Edgewood School District has the lowest property wealth in the state at the time. And a suit was brought, the Rodriguez case, uh, against, um, <clears throat> and taken all the way to the Supreme Court. It was that suit I think that uh, Jose Cardenas that's promoted with research and, and su support. And when we lost it at the Supreme Court on the grounds that education is not a fundamental right to all Americans, uh, no, we, we took it, it was taken then, and uh, he helped out with this to Maldef to bring it in the state courts, and they've won several suits there. 
And the fight is still going on, of course, for equality in, in education, but it's a wonderful. And Al Kaufman was the attorney who brought that, that case. <laughs> Al is here today. Also. In immigration, we had Lee Tehran. Uh, she is a former professor of law at St. Mary's. I got her just as she was retiring. And uh, she directed a university uh, um, that, at St. Mary's uh, Law School, the Immigration and Human Rights Clinic. And Lee Tehran was um, done a very thorough chapter on the history of immigration law in and in the last 50 years particularly, it's come up with over a dozen recommendations for the commission uh, on, on immigration. That's, and then we had uh, look for someone in the field of housing. We didn't have to look far because uh, Henry Cisneros had served as uh, our secretary of, housing, of HUD. And <clears throat> He said, I will come in as long as you bring in Alejandro Becerra, who he considers the top expert on uh, Latino housing in the United States from DC. And so Alejandro has, has come to, to join us and he'll be sitting down with you also. Um, in, you know, the farm workers was a big issue back then in 68. They, they just had a strike in the valley. And Rebecca Flores uh, was trained as a farm worker organizer. And she has written us a history of, of what took place back in 1966 with the farm workers strike. We also have issues of economic security and employment. And those issues are yet to be released, but a lot of work has been done by Ernest Gerlach, uh, who was a former senior fellow at the Center for Urban and Regional Planning at the University of Texas at San Antonio. And we also have some economists in the Valley, Marie Mora, Professor of Economics at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, who are working on that, and, and uh, Alberto Davila, who is at Southeast Missouri State in Cape Girardeau. So there, that is a work in progress. I want to say that Ernest has already given me a hundred, hundred pages of, of, of work that, that we're uh, going to be releasing along as soon as we get the economists' work in and so forth. So there's work to be done yet. These are unfinished re recommendations. And the, the purpose today is to get your input into what else, what we need to recommend uh, going forward. Uh, so I, I'm going to um, leave it at that and say that uh, uh, Catherine Lamont, we present these seven studies and the recommendations along with them with the promise of more recommendations to come from out of this conference. And uh, we're going to, of course, need the help of all of you in making those recommendations as you sit down in round tables today. And in civil rights work, we know that the work really is never done. It's, of course, constant vigilance that is the price of liberty. And thank you very much thank for Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If I could, uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Braschetta, and um, I'd also like to add to that uh, list uh, Councilwoman Maria uh, Berasabal, who's been a consistent um, and passionate voice on housing in our community. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Norma Cantu, uh, who has uh, courageously led the fight on many fronts for Latino civil rights. 
Frank, Frank Herrera, who I found out yesterday was one of the primary drafters on uh, the Rodriguez versus ICISD complaint as a very young attorney. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Diane Mulby, the president of Our Lady of the Lake, uh, for being here with us today, and Councilwoman Sandoval, and I also saw uh, staffers from Councilwoman uh, Shirley Gonzalez's office. Thank you for being with us. Today. So uh, now I have the pleasure of introducing the daughter of uh, Dr. Hector P. Garcia, Ms. Cecilia Garcia Akers. She's a graduate of um, St. Mary's University with a degree in biology and a graduate of the University of Texas Medical Branch, Galveston, uh, with a degree in physical therapy. Her first job was medical assistant to her father for 10 years prior to completing her physical therapy curriculum. She served on the Texas State Board of Physical Therapy Examiners for 12 years, and she's also taught as an adjunct faculty member at the University of Texas Health Science Center, St. Philip's College, and Texas State University Physical Therapy programs. She was director of rehabilita rehabilitative services for three major hospitals here in San Antonio. And currently, she's in private practice uh, here in our city, specializing in geriatric orthopedics, and neuromuscular rehabilitation. She serves as the chair and founding member of the Dr. Hector P. Garcia Memorial Foundation. And we're so thankful that she's continued um, the legacy of service um, that her, her father showed us so many years ago. How fitting to bring uh, the daughter of the first Mexican-American chair of the US uh, Commission on Civil Rights to introduce our current chair. Please help me welcome her. What a great honor for me to be here. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, my husband, Jim, is here and goes everywhere with me. And you know, I'm so blessed to have him. Uh, I know sometimes he wants to uh, leave me somewhere, but he, has not, he hasn't done that yet. So I, I think we've been married, I will be 41 years in January. So, uh, but you know, here we are for, and I wanna thank you for being here and bringing my father's name so prominently into this conference because he really was a trailblazer. And uh, I was able to write a book about him a couple of years ago, which has done very well. It's sold over 4,000 copies nationally. So we're, we're doing well. It's a daughter's perspective on his life and his sacrifices. And I think we forget a person of that magnitude, the sacrifices that he made uh, financially, of course, morally, and the sacrifices of his family, particularly my mother. So I, I, I just think that he was a trailblazer here for all of us, and we, we should never forget. But we should continue his work, because as everyone has said, there is so much to be done, and all you have to do is open the internet and see what is happening to this country. So I was so happy to hear uh, you talked yesterday, Mr. Cisneros, about the need of continuing uh, what we need to do to get this country back on track. So thank you. I am so honored to introduce the keynote speaker this morning. Catherine Lehman is a chair of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. President Obama appointed her to a six-year term on the commission in December of 2016 and the commission unanimously confirmed the president's de designation of her to chair the commission on December 28, 2016. She also litigates civil rights cases at the National Center for Youth Law, where she has been of counsel since October 2017. Before coming to the commission, Lehman served as the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Education until January 2017. President Obama nominated her to the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights position on June 10, 2013, and she was unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate on August 1, 2013. Immediately prior to joining the Department of Education, she was a Director of Impact Litigation at Public Counsel, the nation's largest pro bono law firm. Before that, she practiced for a decade at ACLU of Southern California, 
ultimately as assistant legal director. Earlier in her career, she was teaching fellow and supervising attorney in the appellate litigation program at Georgetown University Law Center after clerking for the Honorable William A. Norris on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. In 2016, Politico Magazine honored her, named her one of Politico 50 Thinkers Transforming Politics in the National Action Network, honored her with their Action and Authority Award. In 2015, Yale Law School named, named her their Gruber Distinguished Lecturer and the Association of University Centers on Disabilities awarded Lehman their Special Recognition Award. Chronicle of Higher Education named her to their 2014 influence list as the enforcer. The Daily Journal listed her as one of California's top women litigators in 2010 and, and 2007 as one of the top 20 California lawyers under 40. In 2004, California Lawyer Magazine named her Attorney of the Year for Civil Rights. She received her JD from Yale Law School, where she was the outstanding woman law graduate, and she graduated summa cum laude from Amherst College. Let's give her a warm San Antonio welcome uh, to this Thank you for the embarrassing introduction. I'm very happy to have that behind me and just delighted to be in this room full of civil rights heroes and fellow travelers in civil rights. It's such a pleasure to get to be with you and so very exciting for me and for the Commission Staff Director, Madam Morales, who traveled from Washington, D.C. with me to be here with you to celebrate this moment and the important record that you are prepared to present. We are so very grateful for the inspiration, the thought of coming together and thinking about what has happened in the 50 years since the Commission made our first foray into investigating Mexican-American civil rights and then creating this incredible body of work that I've had the chance to begin reading and I'm looking forward to continuing reading uh, that, that talks about where we have come, where we have not come, and what work we still have yet to do. Your submission of this material, the, the collection, the work that went into creating this material could not be more timely and uh, could not be more urgent for us as a country and more important to us as a commission. The commission is now in the middle of a two-year investigation into the eff efficacy of civil rights enforcement across the Trump administration. The topic of the effectiveness of federal civil rights enforcement is a topic that the commission has examined many, many times over the 61 year history of the commission because it is so crucial to our country, because we have lived these six decades of a national commitment to civil rights and to the importance of federal civil rights enforcement and to, to reviewing whether and how much we live up to the promises that our country has made to all Americans that we will be treated on the basis of equal dignity and respect. I will say that so far in our investigation, uh, I am not inspired about where we are with respect to federal civil rights enforcement at this moment. And I am deeply, deeply grateful to be able to have the detailed excavation that this report prepares and offers to us, specifically with respect to Mexican American civil rights, for us to be able to examine across all the dimensions that you all have worked so hard to prepare so that we can be our charge, which is to be the nation's eyes and ears with respect to civil rights and be the nation's watchdog, to report to the President, to Congress, and to the American people about what we should see uh, in civil rights life, in, uh, in respect for those rights for all of us. So we will be very pleased to rely on the information that you've prepared uh, and to include it in our ultimate report, which will come out in September, on that topic. I want to say, to the extent that there are further thoughts and points that come forward today uh, in this conference as, as you conclude these days and in the days that are coming, in the coming weeks, that others present think we should know and we should rely on, I really encourage you to submit additional information to us. We keep our record open for public submission until December 17th on this specific investigation. So if people have additional thoughts that didn't make it into this compendium that you think we should know, 
uh, that, that we could rely on, we would very much welcome it. And the, and the place to submit that information, if you do choose to do so, is enforcement at usccr.gov. So enforcement at usccr.gov. It's important to us to be able to hear that information and use it in our public reporting. It's also incredibly exciting to me and emotional for me, frankly, today to, to be here in Texas, returned to this university at this time for this conference, to, to get out of Washington, D.C., to hear what the experience of rights are and are not in places around the country. And it is something I'm very, very proud to have returned us as a commission to in my very short time so far in the commission. Uh, we have because of uh, severe budget cuts to the commission, uh, we, we have principally stayed in Washington, D.C. and asked people to come to us to tell us what their experiences are. As I look at what, what the commission did 50 years ago to be here, to hold a week-long investigation in San Antonio about what, what people's views are, hopes were, fears were on the various topics that the commission investigated, I know that we need to be out around the country more often. We need to be able to make ourselves available to all Americans who want to share their thoughts with us. And so it's, it's incredibly important to me to be able to be with you all today. And as has been mentioned several times in, in this morning session, the, the beauty of this multi-generational gathering of uh, people coming together to share your views and to ensure that we continue the mantle of this work that we honor the legacy of those who came before us to fight and to struggle for us to be able to live better lives than they lived, that, that we then commit ourselves to being willing to continue that is incredibly moving to me. And I want you to know that I am deeply committed to that work. I know Staff Director Mauro Morales is deeply committed to that work. My fellow commissioners and I want to be, plan to be, are honored to be your eyes and ears as we do this work. I also want to share with you what, in addition to the particular investigation of Trump administration commitments to and enforcement of civil rights, uh, will look like what else the Commission is doing with, with our time in this time. We just this week issued a report about police use of force and the civil rights implications of police use of force. I know that's a topic that is in this compendium, so I want you to know that it is uh, very much top of mind for us. Uh, the, the Commission majority recognized in what I know we know in this room, which is that tensions in relations between communities and police have escalated to a point that is past a breaking point in too many American communities, rendering both community members and the police officers sworn to serve them less safe and subject to a fraying social fabric. Uh, we found very consistent patterns that are disappointing in racial disparities in uh, police interactions and rates of use of force with people of color, including, for example, that as of 2014, the number of Latino victims of police killings is 30% above average and 1.9 times the rate for white people. We received bipartisan testimony calling for accountability reforms for uh, police interactions with the public and also as a critical means of safeguarding the uh, public confidence in the police. We also found a uh, recent lack of federal will to engage in the necessary oversight to ensure that our communities are safe. As uh, you all may know, as a, as a parting shot, walking out of being the Attorney General Jeff Sessions issued a memo uh, uh, re redirecting all U.S. attorneys around the country and all United States Department of Justice staff uh, to uh, disavow the use of a consent decree as a tool in the arsenal for the federal government to protect civil rights. That is not limited to policing, but it is certainly a top of mind as a way that, that the federal government is now uh, turning its back on an important tool for ensuring safety in our communities. What our commission uh, investigation showed is, for example, that in seven of the ten cities with the largest reductions in police shootings in recent years, one key commonality among those seven communities was federal intervention, either through collaborative reform or through a consent decree. So the decision of our, of our current administration to walk away from consent decrees as a meaningful tool renders all of us less safe. And it is something that we, as a commission majority, called on the Department of Justice to return to enforcement of constitutional policing, including through the use of consent decrees where necessary. We also uh, recently excavated 
the status of voting rights in this country, and I'm very grateful to hear the, the specific focus on Texas voting rights that uh, I know we will get to review in this report. We, our, our Texas State Advisory Committee to the Commission, as well as the Commission itself, uh, recently examined in the last year the status of voting rights in this country and of voting rights in Texas. And uh, I know we have just passed an election that put on painful display for all of us as a country the degree to which voting rights are a continuing contest in this country and uh, that too many of us are discouraged from, prevented from being able to exercise this core aspect of democracy. Our, our report calls on Congress to enact a new federal law that is sufficient to ensure that our voting rights are not fragile and that each of us is able to cast a vote and be respected in our democracy. We uh, also are in the middle of an investigation of hate crimes and bias-related incidents in schools and uh, the federal government's responsibility to make sure that each of us can be safe. Uh, we issued unanimously a statement that expressed our deep dismay about disturbing rise in hate crimes, including the tragic shootings at the synagogue in Pittsburgh and outside a grocery store in Kentucky, leaving all of us feeling less safe uh, when there is strong evidence that these individuals were targeted on the basis of their faith and their race. Uh, I am, we are still in the middle of that investigation. The commission hasn't yet reported. I don't want to get ahead of what our findings will be, but I can tell you that what is not an appropriate federal role is to give cover to an increased proliferation of hate. And I have... <laughs> I have been, I hear that we have been dismayed about what we see about uh, the creation of a permission structure for that increased proliferation of hate. I want to just identify a few, pl a few places that uh, particularly call out that concern. When I see our president laughing in a speech to police officers about how they should not be so gentle when they guide accused persons into police vehicles, suggesting that a rough ride to the police station would be more appropriate for persons police accused of criminality. I am concerned. In this and in so many other instances, President Trump consistently portrays himself as a divider, disrespecting persons for who they are and discrediting their rights. He uses images and stories of immigrants to foster fear and intolerance, forcibly separating families at the border, adding a citizenship question to the census, and adding a quota for immigration judges, putting up judicial nominees who show a lack of commitment to longstanding uh, civil rights precedents. In this time, when we see alarming stories of the headlines every week about manifestations of hate, in these times, we need a clear message from our nation's leadership about what is and is not acceptable in, as the ideals of, of diversity and tolerance that we should live as Americans. So that brings us to, in these times, how do we work together? What do we do moving forward? And I was just so pleased to hear the reminder for all of us that we have been here before. We have seen moments like this before in this country. Our communities have been in danger in ways that are similar to the moment that we face now. So we know how to do this. We know how to live past it. We know what it is that we need to do. I want to talk to you about what that looks like and what I hope we are all committing ourselves to now. The path forward as I see it is take every single path. That's it. <laughs> there's, there's not, don't pick a priority. Don't, don't pick a lane. You need to throw yourselves, throw your brand, throw everything you have into making sure that all of us are safe, that all of us are respected, and that we actually recommit ourselves to the democracy that we believe in and that we have in common. So I say to you, I'm not giving up on the federal government. I accepted President Obama's call to come to the commission because I believed in this time, which I worried would be just as bad as it is, that it would be important to have a federal voice that would stand for justice, that would stand for what is right, and that would make a record for what it is that we should be doing and that we know we could be doing. I am very pleased with my fellow commissioners and with the staff director to be able to be that voice, and I'm committed to continuing that work. And I hope that none of us 
will give up on the federal government even now. We are making incremental gains even today. Just as one example, this administration, with every time it has had a chance to speak to budgets, to speak to its budget priorities, has asked to devalue civil rights enforcement, has asked to reduce the budgets and to starve the offices for civil rights across the federal government. And the bipartisan Congress both times rejected those requests, both times increased funding for civil rights enforcement across the country, speaking to the value of civil rights enforcement and responding to the call of the commission to say, no, we need to still prioritize those issues. So I, I am proud to have used my prior knowledge about federal budgets to be able to help make that happen. And I am saying it is worth still engaging with the federal government to try to protect what it is that we can in these moments because we do make those gains. In addition. And in addition, because I said we're not we're not picking a lane, we're we're not we're not picking one strategy. We're going at it with every front that we have. We also we also need to look in our local communities at what it is that we can do aside from the federal government to make sure that we have a full and effective safety net. It is well past time for us as a country not to rely only on the federal government to protect our rights. It will never, it can never be in every place that it needs to be as a country. So we need to make sure that we are the safety net in our communities as well and that we stand for them. Uh, we need to strengthen our civil rights protections and our lived experiences in our local communities and one example of the ways that I'm doing that in my life, and I'm encouraging all of you to do that as well, is that I litigate cases on behalf of low-income children and, and uh, children of color at the National Center for Youth Law. I am really thrilled in my life now that I have a personal life in addition to a government life to be able to return to suing people who hurt kids. And uh, I... Uh, <laughs> so, we are standing now at a precipice between whom we hoped we will be, whom we have promised ourselves we will be as a country, and the direct that we may become if we turn our backs on our commitments to ourselves and to our communities. I am so very grateful to see that all of you are spending your Saturday, spending your days together, thinking about what it is we need to do to move us forward, and I am telling you that I am relying on you to take the insights, the commitments from this conference to your everyday forward as you move and we move together to the country that we want to be. So thank you very much for that.